Reminders and such things to begin. There's a homework uh, that's due today. Um, it involves you implementing decision trees and running some experiments and cross-validation and such things. Um, if you haven't started yet, I would recommend starting after class. Um, but don't do it during class. Uh, and, you know, the, I we still have one more office hours today that uh, right after class, if you have any concerns or questions, you can talk about it. And there's been, a, I noticed that there's a lot of active discussion on Piazza. Um, so please take advantage of that. Maybe if you have any questions or concerns, maybe there are your, your concerns are already addressed there. Or if you have any questions, I can take them now. Any questions about the homework? One common question that uh, I heard a few times was, uh, do we need to use LaTeX? Uh, the answer is no, we just need a PDF. I don't care how you make your PDF. Um, if it were me, I would use LaTeX, but you know, that's just me. Yes. Some questions are answered by the outset of the program. No, uh, I need you to explain the reasoning because uh, what if your program has a bug in it? Uh, I need you to see the general idea here is I need you to convince us that you understand what it is that you have submitted. And uh, that's, that allows two things. One, first of all, it helps you. The second thing is uh, in case there is a mistake in the final answer, we still give you partial credit. So uh, if you use a program to generate an answer, I still need to get the explanation from you. So the SMS asks us to print again the entropy of the data. Right. If, uh, I mean, the experiment, uh, we use K4 cross-validation. No, don't do it for K4 cross-validation. Uh, do it for the final training that you do. And uh, when you print entropy, I think uh, we had a discussion about this with the TAs and uh, print the entropy. It's okay if you print the entropy for the top one and all the information gains just for the top. Only for the root. Only for the root. If you've already submitted it or implemented it where you print it for everything, oh, yes. yeah, that's fine. Uh, they don't worry about it. Um, but uh, it's okay if you just do it for the root. Yes. In this case, uh, it is deterministic. Uh, the... Oh, uh, yes, I can't, uh, unless there is a place where there are equal, so let's think about the ID3 algorithm. The only place where there's any non-determinism is if you have two features that have the same information gain, in which case you can basically toss a coin. If a subject, you know, the subject to the constraint that that doesn't happen, your trees will be deterministic. I think it is. Yeah. The, in fact, even the Cross-validation is going to be deterministic because the uh, randomness in cross-validation comes from your split of the data and we've given you the splits. What about the depth? I don't understand. What, what, what do you, what's the question there? Okay. Uh, there's a question on... Uh, uh, Zoom, can we use an Excel file? Can we use Excel to make the calculations and submit the Excel as our answers for part one and part two? Uh, I'm looking at my TAs. How do you feel about that? You know, don't submit the Excel file partly because if you submit an Excel file when we are great. So let me tell you, uh, if you've not been a TA before, while grading, uh, we have to go through 100 and about 50-ish of them. And if everyone uses a different format, different file format and such things, uh, it just slows down grading and it makes uh, for very, very unhappy TAs, which uh, is the last thing I need. Um, so if, just for my selfish reasons, so that I don't get unhappy TAs, put everything in the report. If you if you use Excel to make, uh, to uh, perform all the calculations, then uh, somehow get it into the, uh, uh, into the report, into the PDF. Yes. Uh, so um, only for the experiment section. No, the, that's that's the only place that we are going to be running your code. Yeah. Yes. 
In this case, I think it will be. Um, also, subject to one thing that I'm not going to tell you. Uh, and it should not make a difference with respect to your uh, accuracies. Other questions? Yes. Right. So, uh, yes. If you can do that, if, if you can justify that, that's okay. Um, you can use one of the missing value imputation methods we discussed in class at the end of the decision tree unit. Uh, whatever choice you make, explain it in your report uh, because we need to understand what you did and why. I thought I saw a hand somewhere here. Or did I miss it? No. Okay. Other questions? Uh, according to the schedule, there was supposed to be homework too that will be uh, released tonight. Um, um, it's not going to be available tonight. It's going to be available Thursday, partly because uh, we've not yet covered some of the material that we you'll be needing for this homework. That way you get the full two weeks. Um, so expect homework too on Thursday. And it will cover uh, online learning and Perceptron. In the experiment, we'll be implementing Perceptron and made up several of its variants. And you know, there'll be some theory where you'll be proving something involving online learning. Um, if none of that makes sense to you, hopefully in two weeks, you'll know the answer to everything. Other questions? Let's pick up uh, with uh, the actual technical content. Let's go back to our discussion on linear models. In the last lecture, we looked at linear models. A linear model basically says, if it's a classifier, a linear model says that uh, you need, uh, given a set of features, assign a weight for every feature, take the weighted uh, sum of the features, add a single number called the bias. And if that final result is positive, the prediction is plus or one or true. If the result is negative, the result is minus or zero or false. And uh, this is linear classification and linear regression involves just uh, taking the real number and that's the output uh, before any threshold. Uh, so we looked at an introduction to linear models. We looked at why these are interesting. And uh, today's lecture is about a uh, continuation of uh, the discussion of why these are interesting. What kinds of functions do linear classifiers express? Um, in a perfect world, we would want a set of classifiers that can express every function that's of interest. But we don't know what functions are of interest. So ideally, so that means that we would like to have classifiers that express a large class of potentially interesting functions. And I'm going to argue that linear classifiers do express a large class of potentially interesting functions, but not all. As a result, there's a restriction in the hypothesis space, which means that learning might be possible. So any questions about what linear models are before we talk about uh, their expressiveness? Just to remind uh, you of what linear models are for classifiers. If you have features x, x is a vector. A classifier would be the sign of w transpose x plus b. That means if the sum of wi xi plus b is greater than zero, then output and that's a linear classifier. Um, just to kind of remind you, w transpose x is simply the sum of wi xi. And a linear regression In linear regression, you have the output is simply W transpose X plus B. It's just the real number that comes out. Um, so now uh, in, in this part, we're just going to talk about linear classifiers today. And uh, one interesting question is uh, what kinds of functions do they express? With decision trees, um, I was able to hopefully convince you that decision trees can ex express any Boolean function. What that means is, for 
any Boolean function you can think of, there's a, at least one decision tree that perfectly agrees with that. So we are asking the same question. What Boolean functions can linear classifiers express? It turns out that many Boolean functions, but not all, are linearly separable. Linear, linear separability is just this idea that uh, all the pluses are on one side of the line and all the minuses are on the other side of the line. A linear classifier is the linear part of it. It's the idea that there's a line or a plane or in general, a hyperplane that just slices the instance space and declares that one side is positive and the other side is negative. And when I say that a certain Boolean function is linearly separable, that means that whenever the function says true, that instance falls on the positive side. When the function says false, that instance falls on the negative side. All the true instances fall on one side, all the false instances fall on the other side, and there's some line that perfectly agrees with that particular Boolean function. Let me give some examples here, rather than just talking the abstract. Let's consider a conjunction. We have three features here, x1, x2, and x3, and the output is a y. Um, the output is true, or one, if and only if all the three x's are one, right? So this is a conjunction. I can write this as uh, um, y is x1 and x2 and x3. And if you've not seen this notation before, uh, we'll be using this quite a bit in this class. This is and, that's just shorthand for and, and it's like, uh, I, I write the symbol plus to denote addition. I use this particular symbol to denote uh, uh, conjunction. So I have this function, y is x1 and x2 and x3. And the claim I'm making here is this function is equivalent to the linear classifier y is 1 if and only if the sum of those three things is at least 3. So first of all, let me try to convince you that that's a linear classifier. I said that we need something like this. The sign of this, right? This is the linear classifier. So you have x1, x2, x3. So I can write sum of xi plus minus 3 and the sign of this. This is here the w's are all 1's and the b is a minus 3. And I can see that uh, I can say that, you know, if x1 plus x2 minus plus x3 minus 3 is greater than or equal to 0, then output equals 1, else, or 0. And again, let's make it a 0. Sometimes, uh, so one thing that I want to kind of, uh, I'll mention this multiple times, I use minus 1 and 1 for false and true. Sometimes I use 0 and 1 for false and true. And uh, based on the context, it should be clear. Here I'm using 0 and 1. Anyway, so how do you prove that this is these two things are equivalent? The claim is that this particular linear classifier, or this one equivalently, is identical to this Boolean function. How do you prove it? Because we saw all the values. Exactly. There are only eight things. Yeah. There are literally only eight possible things that the features can take. Rather than thinking too hard, let's just brute force it. Let's enumerate all of them. So you have x1 plus x2 plus x3 minus 3. I can calculate all these numbers. And I look for the sign. Sign is, notice that it's greater than or equal to 3 here. And the sign is uh, uh, positive only when all three of them are true. Only when the output is true. A Boolean conjunction, any Boolean conjunction can be represented as a uh, linear threshold unit. The thing is called a, also called a linear threshold unit. Um, this is a, actually here. I've written this in the, a sim simple. With, I think I've shown you a simple example, but in fact, it's actually a re general recipe. Anytime you have a conjunction, you just take all the elements of the conjunction, add them up, and the sum should be at least equal to the number of things that are in the conjunction. And the only way that's true is if all of them are one because these things can only be zero or one. Uh, to kind of extend this recipe, I can also include negations. If I have a negation, like the notation here is uh, x1 and x2 and not x3. This is a not x3. Uh, the just take it as a, as a recipe here for now. Uh, 
anytime I see a negation, I can replace it with one minus x three because one minus x three is true. It uh, takes the value one when x three is equal to zero. So I can in the same recipe where I just added them up. Here I have x one plus x two plus one minus x three should be at least three. I can reorganize that and I just get x one plus x two minus x three. That's a linear threshold unit that perfectly corresponds to this thing. And to prove it, we can just enumerate. It's not just about uh, uh, you know conju uh, conjunctions. It turns out that disjunctions are also linearly separable. A disjunction is uh, a function where the output is true if at least one of them is true. And I'll leave it as an exercise for you to think about inventing a linear classifier where for y equals x1, or this symbol is used for R, X2, or X3. So invent a linear classifier, you can do that offline and we can talk about it uh, uh, if you have any questions. Are there any questions otherwise about this, this simple example here? If not, we're going to charge ahead. Yes, there's a question. Yeah. Say that again. Oh, the answer to that question. Basically, yes, you're right. Now, uh, uh, the bias term becomes greater than or equal to one because at least one of them has to be true. Okay, I can generalize conjunctions and disjunctions into this uh, thing that we've encountered before called an M of n function. The output y is true if given among the n features that are there, there is some fixed set of n con uh, consisting of m features. If at least, uh, sorry, there is a fixed set of n features out of the features that exist. Out of them, if at least m of them are true, then the output is true. So here's an example. I can have, there are five features, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. And my rule is at least two out of x1, x2, and x3 should be uh, true for my output to be true. So the question is, what should a linear, what linear threshold unit is equivalent to that? The claim is any M of n function is linearly separable. So can someone come up with yes? That's one thought. Has to be part. Has to be largely unequal to two. That's right. It's la larger than or equal to two because at least if at least two of them are true, the output's true. Right? The inequality is satisfied. So any M of n function is also linearly separable. Now you could ask me why are m of n functions interesting? The answer is they form fantastic classroom exercises and homework questions. Um, that's pretty much the only uh, reason for their interest to the best of my knowledge. Any questions about what we've seen so far? We've looked at conjunctions. Oh, there's a um, there's a comment. This slide is not in the lecture slides. I believe it is. Yes. It's not the same? Okay, I'll update it. It's pro I usually make edits to the slides before the class anyway. So I will, after class, I'll post the update. So what have we seen so far? Boolean conjunctions are uh, linearly separable. Boolean disjunctions are linearly separable. And if you can throw in a negation if you want, there's a recipe that says, anytime there's a negation, replace it with one minus that variable. That, so you can have conjunctions with negations, disjunctions with negation. All of these are linearly separable. Is there a limit here? Turns out there's a very simple function that is not linearly separable. And the proof for that is actually, it's easier to prove it by pictures than by actually formally doing it. Parity functions are not linearly separable. The exa an example of the parity function is XOR. If you have two features, the output is true if both of them are true, or both of, her, of them are false. Uh, if one of them is true and the other one false, then the output is false. Actually, I think this might be an X naught, but it doesn't really matter. And here's a sort of a easy way to prove, think about proving it. Try to draw a line that keeps only the pluses on one side and all the minuses on the other side. You can't. Alternatively, if you really want to occupy, have a, you know, uh, engage a kid for a long time, give them this puzzle. Uh, ask them to draw a line that separates the pluses and the minus. Uh, 
you can't draw a line that separates the pluses and minuses. And this is a simple Boolean function. In fact, I can have x1, 2, and then when both of them are true or both of them are false, the output is x naught. This is x naught. Yeah, this is an x naught. So x naught is just the opposite of that. But either one of these are not linearly separable. So this is actually, you know, this is a useful counterexample to keep in mind. Um, there's a lot of history in uh, the history of AI slash machine learning involving the XOR function. Um, the parity function was, uh, uh, when we get to the perceptron algorithm, I'll talk about this, but uh, the perceptron algorithm is a class, is a model that can learn linear classifiers and it was invented in the 1950s and there was a whole rage about what can the perceptron not do? It's so amazing. Until uh, there was a proof uh, by Minsky and Papert saying that, yeah, the perceptron can't do the XR function. And that led to, if the mythology is to be believed, that led to immediate loss of funding for all AI research and the whole agenda came crashing. It was not quite that, but uh, that's a nice story. Not all functions are linearly separable. Uh, XR is not linear. Uh, in general, parity in uh, high dimensions is also not linear. Parity would be the output is one if the number of ones is even, the output is zero. Uh, otherwise, this is not a linear function in the features. And in general, arbitrary non trivial uh, Boolean functions are not going to be linearly separable. So, in fact, there's a special set of functions the conjunctions, disjunctions, um, M of n functions, these are the linearly separable ones. If you pick a random Boolean, if you construct a random Boolean function like this thing here, it's not going to be linearly separable in the features. So that kind of makes the whole thing problematic. We can't do arbitrary Boolean functions. Is that necessarily a bad thing? I would argue not because uh, uh, if you work with simple functions and you find a good classifier, there's no reason to include the uh, additional complexity. And more importantly, even a function that's not superficially linearly separable can be coerced into becoming linearly separable. So let me give you an example. Here is imagine a data set, this data set consisting of one dimensional points. These points, uh, 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 that means that there's only one feature and uh, that feature takes, is called X. It's a real number. Some of these points are labeled classes and some of these are, some of these are labeled, I guess, dots. And the question is, can you draw a one dimensional line that separates the pluses and the dots? Before that, what is a one dimensional line? I could hear it. A point, a single point, a one dimensional line is just a point because you're talking about a threshold, a point plus an arrow that says one side is positive and the other side is negative. You can't separate the, the dots from the pluses by putting a you know, by partitioning on this side, you can't put it here either. No matter where you put the partition, some of the dots are going to be misclassified. So this data set is not linearly separable in this day, in this representation. But the trick is you can add additional features. So you change the representation. In particular, the so what I'm, in this case, what I'm going to suggest is for every point x, I'm going to convert it into a two-dimensional feature vector where the first dimension is x and the second dimension is x squared. So what might that look like? It takes points on this line and converts it into these points. So this dimension is x and here is x squared. So for instance, this point here, if it was originally, if it was minus two, now we have a two-dimensional point minus two comma four. I can apply this to every example on the line, even future examples. This is a deterministic transformation that requires, you know, there's nothing, uh, uh, there's nothing fancy about this specific transformation, but I can apply this now. Now, in this two-dimensional space, suddenly I can draw a line. Mm -hmm. I can draw a line where that puts all the pluses on one side and all the dots on the other side. In the two-dimensional space, the linear, the data is linearly separate. 
So the data was not originally linearly separable, but I employed a feature transformation. I Sometimes people call it, I blew up the representation into a new space where the data is linearly separable. Any questions about this? There must be questions here. Yes. So we can do this the same thing for the XR transform in the previous slide? You can. And in fact, I'll leave it as an exercise for you to invent a transformation uh, that does that. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's a very good question. <laughs> How would you transform the XOR in two dimensions into a new space where it's linearly separable? So there are really two questions. What should the new space be? And what's the transformation? Perhaps it's higher dimensional, perhaps not. Uh, I saw two hands. I'll go to you and then you. Yes. Yeah. At the back, yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you mean by can we use the multiplication function? Yes. So, um, the feature transformation has to apply to each example separately. So the, the feature transformation is you have x0, you have two features, x1 and x2. And this gets transformed, let's call that, I, I use the notation phi for feature transformations. This gets transformed with some function phi. So phi of x1 comma x2 and each row Yes. So Yeah, you can do that. Uh, that's that that could in fact that's gonna work. Mm -hmm. That's a reasonable feature transformation for the XR. Mm -hmm. Uh yes. Since is so you need the negative So what do you mean? Can we use the same? You can, the, 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 you know, the sky is the limit. You can use whatever you want with the feature transformation. For now, these transformations have to be deterministic, which means you need to know what it is up front. You need to, you know, you can't learn the feature transformation for now. Uh, so you can do whatever you want. You can apply any function provided, let's just uh, kind of make sure the, what what's necessary. So imagine that you have some input x1, x2, xd. This is a d-dimensional vector, let's call this x. And I'm going to apply a function phi to get phi of x. And just so that we have, uh, we give uh, names to these things, let's say we call these things v1, Z2, these are the elements of that phi of x. And it does not have to have d dimensions, it has, let's say, n dimensions. So the transformation from here to here is done by phi. For now, phi is fixed. You could come up with that, but the goal is to invent a transformation such that in the new in the new representation in the z's, I can write the true function, the target function as in other words, this is equal to the sine of W transpose Z, the vector plus V. If you can, invent, the, the goal of inventing that psi function is to come up with some transformation such that in the new space, the data is linearly separate. Yes. Uh, so if we, uh, according to that, uh, that strategy, if we convert the zero to negative one, uh -huh. and then uh, then we say that we multiply those two anything times that mm -hmm. one, then it's a plus. Yeah. But uh, it's a negative one. Right. But in multiplying those two, in is it a linear operation? It's not. The feature transformation is a deterministic function that you have invented and it doesn't have to be linear. The only thing is 
in the target space, you are going to learn a linear function. The important point here is you are not learning anything nonlinear. You are inventing, just thinking hard about the problem and coming up with a linear uh, a function, a transformation phi. The transformation need not be linear because it's not being learned. Uh, the only thing that will be learned is the W, which operates in the high dimensional space, in the new space. You don't look convinced. So, uh, what's your question? The multiplication of two features does not give, leave you with a linear uh, thing. In fact, even in the tiny example that I had here, right, going to x square is no longer linear. X square is simply x multiplied with itself. So the real function, this, in fact, let's uh, take this to conclusion. Uh, conclusion. The, let's call this, instead of x square, let's call this z2, let's call this z1. So z1, z2 is simply x and x square. The final function is this line here is going to be w1, z1 plus, plus b, which is simply w1, x plus w2, x square plus b. In the original space, we don't have anything that's linear anymore. But in the new space, we have something that's linear. Okay. But for, for that example, even in the new space, are we getting a linear function? Yeah, of course. Because uh, here, right? Whoa. Okay. That's... What did I do? Can people see anything on Zoom yet? Or has it stopped sharing there too? Okay. Is visible now? Okay. So in this new space, so you're going to have is simply the product of x1, x2. This is plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one. Let's call this thing z. And my output is uh, if minus z greater than or equal to zero, plus one, else minus one. It's linear. Other questions? There's one question that uh, you should be thinking about. Yes. Is finding a function where you add another piece that feels like you kind of have to guess what you are as a function? That is the question you should be thinking about. The question was, this is all well and good. How can I invent a phi if I don't know the true function? If I do not know the oracle function, I, in this particular phi was invented because the oracle was XOR. How do you know what the oracle function is? We don't. So how do you know what the right feature transformation is? We don't. We take guesses. And by doing that, we essentially increase the hypothesis. All we are doing is increasing the, the hypothesis space for the learner. We are not searching over linear functions anymore. We are searching over quadratic functions or cubic or something else. We are essentially guessing the hypothesis space by applying a feature transformation. That's a good question. We, we do not know what is the good feature transformation. In fact, one perspective on modern machine learning from about 2015 or so is the success of modern machine learning is because we have given up the search for feature transformations manually and made that into a learning problem. And doing that again and again gives you multi-layer neural networks. Uh, we essentially learn the feature transformation. We keep doing that layer after layer. We'll get there. I'm basically just uh, foreshadowing a lecture that will be like towards the end of the semester. Okay. Um, that's about feature transformations, but uh, let's go back to linear uh, Classifiers. So one thing is not all data, not all data sets, not all concepts are linearly separable. And a potential answer here is, well, I might be able to invent or discover accidentally or knowingly some feature transformations that make my life better. Sometimes your data is not linearly separable, but is almost linearly separable. So if you have data set like this, there is really no line that can separate the pluses and the minuses, but you can almost get all of them right. So then the question is, if you're willing to live with some error, maybe you are, you, you are giving yourself a simpler search problem and uh, there's a trade-off. 
an easier search problem versus potential overfitting. Here, there's not the you there's lower risk of overfitting. So there's a trade-off, and it's a good uh, you know it's a, it's a a linear classifier is at least a good first thing to try, no matter what you have. So, yes. Uh, if you all have examples, we need to point in the sources and then um, judge about that the data is in the comparable or not. But sometimes the high value we cannot visually. Yes. That, so the question, let me repeat the question because it's a very interesting one. The question is, in the examples that I showed you here, it's in two dimensions. I just put points on a plane and said, look, it's linearly separable or look, it's not linearly separable. How do you do this in high dimensions? In high dimensions, you cannot actually do it visually, of course, and you need an algorithm. One of the, one of the earliest algorithms to decide whether a certain set of points is linearly separable or not, it turns out is isomorphic, has the same structure, it's basically identical, to the perceptron algorithm. So the perceptron learning algorithm is actually a test for linear separability, it turns out. Also, in fact, it was first introduced that way in some mathematics journal um, and then you know rediscovered as a machine learning algorithm. So any machine learn any algorithm that learns a linear classifier can be used as a test for uh, linear separability. Okay, let me wrap this up. Um, linear classifiers are a useful and expressive hypothesis class because many functions are linear and often it's a good guess for a hypothesis space. Actually, it's actually a good first guess for a hypothesis space. You try out a linear classifier. If that works, you're done. If not, then you think harder about the problem. Uh, but it's always important to know that some functions are not linear, uh, like XOR and uh, most, many Boolean functions. But then you can make them linear in a different space by employing a certain employing some feature transformation. And this is a useful trick to have in your toolkit. Uh, the idea that the inputs that are given to you are not necessarily the only way in which your program should encounter them. You can apply some pre-processing. Feature transformations are nothing but pre-processing. You can apply some pre-processing to change the inputs before you feed it into a machine learning algorithm. And this is a way, not only is it a useful trick, it's something that uh, even people who kind of do this for a living uh, sometimes forget. Um, I've encountered you know, cases where, for example, we were trying to, uh, some uh, many years ago, some of us were trying to replicate a paper and we implemented everything exactly as they described and somehow their performance was always 2% uh, better than anything that we could do. And we had no idea why. Um, and after a lot of uh, um, searching, we found that there was a footnote in the paper that said, oh yeah, we added the, uh, uh, we had the quadratic uh, feature transformation in, addi in addition to the linear stuff. And that gives you 2%. Um, similarly, you know, adding the bias term and not adding the bias term changes the expressiveness of your linear classifier. Not adding the bias term forces your lines to go through the origin or the hyperplanes to go through the origin. So, you know, that's a common mistake that uh, might show up in people's code or implementation. These sorts of things make the model worse because they have reduced the expressiveness. The reason reduced expressiveness makes the model worse is because the true answer is ne in neither one of these sets of functions, but the one with the more expressive. Uh, set of the one that's more expressive has a better answer, and so you're increasing the search space, taking your allowing your learner to discover a better function. Any questions about? Uh, um, yes. Not necessarily. Um, the the feature transformation is essentially data agnostic here. It could be data dependent, but it is the ones that I described are data agnostic. Yes. Does that mean feature transformations allow linear classifiers to express any function with the Boolean output? Depending on what the feature transformation is, the answer is yes. Okay, cool. Um, which is, uh, uh, I want you to think about this a little more carefully before getting very happy about it. <laughs> because uh, there is 
a hidden sort of an exponential there. So just be aware that it's not it doesn't come, it's not a free thing. Um, I want to briefly talk about this bias term and why it's needed because it's one of those things that is very important. And you know, I, I'm not, I won't spend too much time talking about this after this, and so this will be the one discussion on this bias term. Recall that the bias term here is B. It's that uh, constant that is independent of any feature. Imagine that uh, B was zero. If B was zero, this line would go through the origin. And only lines that go through the origin would be allowed, which means that if your true data looks like this, you can no longer separate. It. So for just adding this one extra uh, parameter to be learned allows you far greater flexibility without having to do weird pre-processing, like moving the data uh, so that everything is centered and such things. So always, always, when you are, anytime you're using a linear uh, classifier now, and you know, with neural networks, we'll call them a linear layer. Anytime this shows up, have a bias term. It's negligible extra cost. You just need one more number and it increases the expressiveness quite a bit. So don't, uh, you know, you may not, otherwise you might end up with this kind of a situation where you will find a suboptimal uh, classifier because you did not add a bias term. I'll wrap this up. This is the end of the discussion introducing linear classifiers. Um, but it's just exercises which you, we spoke about it in class also, but uh, offline, I want you to kind of think about these represent the simple disjunction as a linear classifier and think about how you might apply the feature space expansion trick for the XOR function. In fact, try to invent more than one such trick. It, there's no single linear transfer, feature transformation that's the right answer. There are a couple of them. So invent a different one that we did not see in class. Any questions? Yes. I mean, in the actual mm -hmm. uh, and, and that general is pretty well, but it works like in the data set to do that. You know, the function that will be most performance with data that will be separated from the data that will end up with something that's really overfit. Yes. Yep. You can do all of that. So if you arbitrarily transform the features. If you allow arbitrary transformations, you will overfit. In fact, the most uh, sophisticated uh, feature transformation, or not the most, but a rather sophisticated feature transformation involves something called the uh, radial basis function. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but essentially what it ends up doing is, given a data set, it draws a little circle around, it can draw a little circle around every positive point and say the inside is positive and the outside is negative. And so every positive point gets its own little circle and that's a useless feature transformation. You, it allows that kind of, uh, 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 that kind of transformation. It's essentially an infinite degree polynomial. 